Right, good evening, everyone. Yep, thank you for showing up here today, this evening. Okay, so today I am going to talk about Ezekiel, but not only about Ezekiel, I'm going to talk about the larger notion of a parable. Because I think it's an important question that needs to be addressed. And there's some very surprising aspects of a parable, but before I begin, let me try to contextualize what Ezekiel chapter 20 is set in, because it's a very interesting chapter. Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 20 literally marks the boundary between Ezekiel prophesizing the imminent destruction of Jerusalem, which he has done for 20 chapters, and Ezekiel transitioning to other prophecies about other kingdoms. So there's a very clear dividing line in Ezekiel 20. And the reason for this is because Ezekiel's prophecies are largely done in chronological order. If you read in Ezekiel tracks the year very carefully, year by year, one by one, in his prophecies, in the seventh year, in the fifth year, in this, this month or the, fifth, or the fifth year, in this month or the seventh year. So that's how Ezekiel's prophecies, are, that's how Ezekiel's, um, each of Ezekiel's messages are delivered. It is very often appended with a location in time and in space. So when you read Ezekiel, it is often worth keeping in mind the context in which Ezekiel is writing about. And likewise, there is no way you are going to understand Ezekiel's parables, or indeed any parable at all, as I will go on to explain, without understanding the context around parables. Because when it comes to parables, context is all important. So what is it about Ezekiel 20 that catches my attention? Well, it's what happens at the very end of Ezekiel 20. Because at the very end of Ezekiel 20, right in verse 46, 49, Ezekiel spent the first 44 verses of verse 20 speaking in fairly plain language. And the last four verses sliding into metaphorical language. Something metaphorical language in the sense, set your face against the south, preach against the south, against the forest of the south land, that the forest of the south land is going to burn, is going to burn out. And the reply of his audience at the end of this metaphorical oracle is this. Then I said, Sovereign Lord, they are saying of me, isn't he just telling parables? And you can picture, right, Ezekiel, Ezekiel has been sitting there, the elders of Israel have come to inquire of him. For 47, 48 verses, he's explained, to it, he's explained to God. He's been told by God to explain to them in great detail where Israel has gone wrong, step by step, again and again. And it ends with, nope, sorry, Jerusalem is doomed. And the response of the elders is, he's just talking in parables. And you can imagine, really, that this is the reaction of Ezekiel. Exasperation. <laughs> Face palm. It's an indication of exasperation, right? <laughs> I mean, take, take away for a moment. What's wrong with these people? They, how do they not know what I'm talking about? Okay, so, introduction aside, let's, I want to go through, as usual, on the con. Uh, on the circumstances behind this, or this oracle, right? So, Ezekiel, first initial prophecies took place in that time period between the second wave of deportations of Jews to, Jeru to Babylonia and the third and final destruction of Jerusalem. The third and final deportation, which was the destruction, after the destruction of Jerusalem. So, Ezekiel was deported during the second wave, along with King Jeconiah, the penultimate king of Israel. In place, the Babylonians installed a king called Zedekiah. And history tells us that this exile occurred in 597 BC. And history tells us that the next and final exile occurred in 587 BC, when Jerusalem was annihilated and destroyed after a siege, after a three-year siege. And that siege began in 589 BC. Now, where does this prophecy occur? Where does this Ezekiel's, where does Ezekiel's, where does Ezekiel 20 occur, sorry? Ezekiel 20 occurs in 590 BC. This is just a year before King Nebuchadnezzar would lay siege to Jerusalem for three years and then raise it to the ground. So, the chapter begins then in a very interesting narrative format. In the seventh year, in the fifth year, month of the 10th day, 
some of the elders of Israel came to me and inquired of the Lord, and they sat down to, in front of me. Now, the commentaries all agree that we do not know what is it that the, that the elders of Israel were talking about. We do not know where this was. The elders of Israel who were in Babylon, that means who were already exiled, or whether this were people, these elders who came all the way from the people of the remnants who were still living in Judah, are the king Zedekiah to inquire of Ezekiel. We don't know that. But what we do know is that God's response is incredulous. Because God responds in verse, in, in verse 3, in verse 2, verse 2 and 3, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Have you come to inquire of me? As surely as I live, I will not let you inquire of me, declares the sovereign Lord. And so, what follows is 44 whole verses where, and I'm not going to go through all the verses because it's a huge mafu and for time constraints, but in 44, 44, 44 verses, God instructs Ezekiel to recount the history of the apostasy of the Jews regarding God. So we begin, so basically, basically in a parallel to Stephen, to, to, to Stephen in Acts, talking about the history of the Jews in relation to the coming of Christ, Ezekiel is told to go through the history of the Jews ever since they left Egypt. So when, they left, so when, is, when the Jews left Egypt, there was a covenant that was signed between them and God. The problem is that the Israelites rebelled against God, against God, and that generation did not see the promised land. That generation saw the promised land, went to the promised land, their children began to rebel against God again, and God again forgave them, despite the rebellion. And then the kings that followed rebelled again, and God again forgave them. But the point that the first 44 verses basically, is, basically says, and it says this again and again in certain ways, is that the Jews are unfaithful. The Jews have committed crimes that have fractured their relationship between them and God to the point that it's irreparable, to the point that God can no longer protect them. Will no longer protect them. And what are those crimes? They are threefold. Unfaithfulness, idolatry, and blasphemy. And more specifically, the law is not kept. The Sabbath has been repeatedly desecrated. The Jews have a very distressing tendency to last over false idols. So therefore, the sovereign Lord God proclaims that the exile of the Jews in Babylonia will continue. But not only will it continue, God tells you that the remaining Jews who are still at, at that point of time in Judah, the those remaining Jews are condemned. They are also going to join you in exile. So Ezekiel 20 in a nutshell, we replicate it. Okay, so this is, this, is, this, this is basically a rough summary of Ezekiel 20. And what point is, and I'm trying to drive, okay, so I'm trying to drive at this, at this point, right? Ezekiel exasperated the says, isn't he telling parables? And this leads to what I really want to talk about my sermons today, today. Because we know, obviously, parables aren't just parables. They, look, when God tells a parable, when his prophets tell a parable, when Christ tells a parable, a parable occurs because these parables have some kind of meaning. They convey something, right? Which then opens up the question, if we want to talk about parables and their role within our faith, within our lives, within our walk with God, then we have to ask ourselves some questions, right? What is a parable? When is a parable not a parable? Why are parables told? Why do we dismiss parables? Because remember, 49 basically tells us that everything that Ezekiel just said for the past, everything that Ezekiel had just proclaimed was dismissed by the Jews as just parables. So why is it that we tend to dismiss parables? And finally, how are parables relevant to our context today? Because parables seems to be this distant thing that Christ did, this distant thing that actually you find quite a bit of it in the Old Testament. Of. So I'm going to emphasize how surprisingly frequent parables are in the Bible. 
We often, I think, in the set narrative, associate parables in the Bible with Christ in the New Testament. But in actuality, there are lots of parables in the Old Testament. There are 43. I think there's many, there's one, according to one count, there's 43 parables in the Old Testament. And the book of Ezekiel has the most number of parables among all of those books. You, a lot of people see, see it as a book of prophecy, but it's also a book of a lot of parables. And of course, if we go to the New Testament, it's been calculated that 35% of the words of Christ within the Gospels take the form of parables. 35. One in every three words in the Gospel is in the, in the form of parable. So clearly, I think you need the concept of the parable is something that is worth going through, worth exploring, and worth considering. So what's a parable? A parable and the coincidence, oh, the, the word parable actually resembles the word parabola, right? The arc of a ball, you throw up a ball, a ball is thrown in a parable, like a parabolic arc. Um, and that coincidence is no, and that coincidence is really no coincidence because it shares the same root word. It comes from the word parabole, throwing alongside. Bole, throwing alongside. So parables aren't just hanging by themselves out there alone. They are something that God comes alongside something. Right? They are tro I'm throwing out something alongside something. So that's a literal idea of a parable. And, there, and from that point, we get the idea that the parable has several possible definitions. It could be a short narrative that illustrates a point. So I have a point to make. That point may be an abstract point. What is the love of God like, for example? And then I might reply with a parable that illustrates what the love of God is like. Or in other words, right, parables in the Bible are important because they are a means to explain deep spiritual truths of God. And, in the, and this explanation takes the form of analogies and metaphors. And the reasons why we use the form of or why God uses the form of analogies and metaphors is for the benefit of the audience. Because you want to ground a point that may sound abstract to the audience in something that is concrete, in a story that keeps the point, hammers the point home into the audience. So to give an illustration why I mean that, let's look at um, Luke 15. Luke 15 is famously the parable of the prodigal son. But it illustrates the abstract point of reconciliation with sinners with God. The reconciliation of sinners with God is like the prodigal son that came back to his father. And another important point, I think one final point you can think about think of parables is that parables are often taken from ordinary lives. The listeners are supposed to be expected to understand these parables from the context of their time. And in actuality, I would explain to, at the very end, that actually, the, actually, the parable at the very end of Ezekiel twenty is something that the Jew, that the that the Jews, that the Jews, Jewish elders that came to Ezekiel ought to have understood. So parables are taken for ordinary life, and I think more importantly, we can draw something important from parables, and that is parables comes from some kind of context. If you note that, that if you note what happens in many of the parables of Christ, it comes prefaced with prolonged and detailed explanations of what Christ is trying to, talk, trying to talk about. So, for example, that, and this context is usually a trigger. So, let's take, for example, um, let, 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 let's, let, let's go back to example for the prodigal son, Luke 15, right? One, in, in verse 1, we are told the context, the context is sparked in the parable. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So, the context is Christ is eating with sinners. Pharisees is asking, why are you eating with sinners? You are such a holy man, why are you mingling with sinners? So, then the question is, why would Jesus, the deeper question is, why would Jesus welcome sinners? And this deeper question, which emerges from the context, which, which you can draw from the context, has an abstract answer. And the abstract answer is that God desires reconciliation with sinners. And... The parable, therefore, becomes the prolonged illustration of what reconciliation of sinners is like. Because we have the example in Luke 15 of the man who finds, who finds a lost coin, 
the lost sheep, several power, several energies are given, several famous energies are given. But ultimately, you want to recognize all these energies converge on this trigger point, right? This, tri this trigger of what does it mean when God say, when, it, when it is said that God desires reconciliation with sinners? So when you do this, when, when, when you look at it this way, when you look at it from, from this perspective, you realize there is a structure to this parable. There is a very clear structure to this parable. You have this trigger. It is some inquiry, it is something said by someone, it is something that is done outside the context of the doer. So in the case of Ezekiel 20, the provoking trigger is clear. The elders of Israel came just a year before Jerusalem was to be put under siege to inquire of Ezekiel about something. So that's the trigger. Um, the question, the question then is, all right, in Ezekiel, all right, so why would God not respond to the inquiries of the Israelites? Or in the case of Christ, why would Christ eat with sinners? Then, the abstract, then there is an abstract answer. In the case of Ezekiel 20, rebellion. In the case of Christ's reconciliation. You notice, it's interesting contrast, right? Notice that, uh, that much of the Old Testament parables are centered around an analogy of rebellion, while many of the New Testament parables are centered around an analogy of redemption and reconciliation. And from this abstract answer, you have this concrete parable, which is referring to something that the listeners should understand that explains this abstract answer, expounds further on this abstract answer by telling you what this abstract answer is likened to in reality, in your actual grounded material everyday reality. So coins are part of everyday reality. A sheep is part of everyday reality. You know what a forest is. You know what a forest fire is for the matter. Yet, I think, if this is the case of the process, if this is the case of what parables are, they are meant to make things clearer to the audience, there is a very strong irony about parables, and that is that even though they are meant to make things clearer to the readers by bringing something that is abstract, that is complex, that is obscure, into something that is grounded in reality, the listeners of parables are notorious in the Bible for missing the point, dismissing parables, or saying something that is absolutely, utterly inane. Which leads, I think, to the question, the, the, the next question, right? Why do we miss the point? Why do we miss the point? And I would like to put forth that it is quite possible that, even, that we ourselves, even though we work with Christ, even though we are raised often with a clear explanation of many of the parables in the Bible, we often run the By the way, one possible answer would be that there's this, look, there's a connection between abstract, between abstraction and concrete illustration, but sometimes this connection is not understood because the crowd, the audience, is expecting a literal tell me straight to me answer. That's one possibility. The connections are missed because they're not looked for. No one's looking for the connections. No one recognizes that, the, no one recognizes that right now God has chosen to, sp to speak in that parable format. That's one possibility. But maybe not because parables are so common that, you should, common that usually if someone is preaching a parable, you should be able to recognize what it is if you're educated in the word. The other possibility, I think this one that is often, very often raised, is that parables often convey truths that are unwelcome. Sometimes parables are given because they don't tell you what you want to hear, they tell you what you need to hear. And the elders of Israel need to hear that their condemnation cannot be reversed, so they should not be desperately trying to inquire again and again and again about the same question. And the Pharisees needed to hear that God is not just a God of, judge, of judgment, not, not just a God that approaches and gathers the righteous, but a God that redesires reconciliation between sinners and himself. And those points often act against our worldview. 
I will not pretend to speak for any of us, but I think if we analyze and look at the hearts, there are probably one or two parables in the Bible that may have equally unwelcome contents. I suspect so. They may speak against what we are biased to believe, a political belief we hold, some kind of culture, a social belief we hold, some kind of position we have in society. We have in society some teachings are hard, and I think that's why people miss the point of parables. I think another third reason is that we often take parables in isolation. We don't, it is, I think, a common, a common problem when we read the Bible, we'll take the Bible in isolation without the context of what's around it because it's just so easy just to open the passage and just read the passage as, as its own. Likewise, parables, when you take in isolation, are not comprehensible legible. And they're not comprehensible legible for a very simple reason because of the trigger question abstract answer concrete parable process. If you just take the parable passage, if you just take concrete parables, you've, not, you've just ignored all the three other stages to a parable that precedes the parable itself. So when you take it in isolation, I think there's kind of a misunderstanding. And I think that it right away draws something important for how we evangelize, right? Because when we evangelize, we have to take care that what we preach is not taken in isolation. It is not grounded without context. For example, let me give you an example. We walk up to an uh, unbeliever and say, Jesus loves me. Well, does that thing have any meaning to an unbeliever? If he doesn't believe in the existence of God in the first place, then that thing has no meaning, right? So clearly, maybe, so clearly, maybe when, we explain, when we evangelize the word, we have to strive to think of how you make that point understandable from the worldview of your audience. So that is one possible way to look, up, to, to, to look at it. I think that's a final reason why we don't get parables, although it's one that is easily, often easily redressed, and I'm going to explain why. Right, so the everyday reality of many parables are lost on the audience. For example, take the parable of the sower, the famous parable of the sower. If you have never sowed in your life, does that parable really make sense? I mean, that is a, that's, that's, a, that's a question. Um, I would say that parables also have another purpose. They are a filtering mechanism. They are used to separate receptive from unreceptive audiences. Because a receptive audience who hears and understands the word knows what the parable is talking about. An unreceptive audience is fundamentally unwilling to even understand what the parable is talking about. So it's a sort of filter gate between the people for whom God's message can reach and the people for whom God's message, whose, whose hearts are too hard for God's message. But of course, it leads to a positive one, right? Often, again and again, parables are greeted with blank incomprehension from the audience. This blank incomprehension is a very common reaction to parables. Even the apostles were guilty of blank incomprehension in the parables of Christ. So why would God even bother telling parables to unreceptive audience? I'd like to put forth to you that parables actually are seem very situationally grounded in a particular time and place. But actually, they aren't. A parable that is passed down to us through the word, transmitted through time, through space, is not just meant for the physical audience we're reading within the narrative that is listening to the parable there, live there and then. It is meant for audiences that hear the parable recounted again and again in sermons, in lectures, in Bible studies, in classes. Parables are timeless. They are meant for us. The parable of the prodigal son made in response to the complaints of the Pharisees, I think it's an invitation to Christianity to not fall into the trap of self-righteousness as the Pharisees are in the trap of misunderstanding God as the Pharisees, for example. I think that the parables of Ezekiel 20 talks about the threats of apostasy. But not just apostasy, the threats of, making, of, make, of moving towards apostasy without knowing that you are moving in apostasy. Because I think, and I think that all of us struggle often to put God first in our lives. And when we don't do that, I think, we already 
in the footsteps of the sins of the Israelites. This is unfortunate. This is unfortunate. Which I think is why we need to always be mindful of that need of reconciliation with Christ. It's a continual process. Because we have a tendency as fillable men to stray. So, parables, are they relevant today? I think that parables, because they are timeless, and because they refer to some abstract point, actually are dynamic things because they can also be re-illustrated in a similar concept understandable to the audience. So let's go back to the parable of the soul again, right? None of us soul. But parallel still exists today, right? Because we can understand the intuition behind the parable of the sewer. Look, a seed is an investment. You plant seeds, you are investing. Every investment, anyone who's ever invested, ever considered planning for retirement funds, knows that every class of investment yields, uh, has a different yield, has a different risk, has a different rate of failure. Some soils are harder, some soils are lower, uh, softer, some soils have higher yields, some soils have lower yields. Some stocks are riskier, some stocks have higher yields, some stocks have lower yields, some stocks are safer. Things like that. But, but, we still spread the word and still evangelize, though our words may fall onto deaf soil, just as even if investment, save, your savings are not predictable, your, investment, your, your investments are not predictable, you still invest and you still save for your retirement, else you have no, reti no returns. So that is, I think, an example of how often parables can be recasted back from their original concrete form to the abstract form and back to another concrete form that is similar to the parable and conveys the same meaning to listeners today. So I would like to posit with you then that parables are a powerful tool of evangelization. If you are lost about what to share with others, sometimes a good parable to illustrate some point often goes a very long way to illustrating truths. Let me give you an example, right? Um, let's say you want to explain the concept of the fruit of spirit, grace, kindness, politeness, self-control, against all these things that are no laws. Well, if I was to explain to a digital native who's entered through chat rooms and forums and so on, or Facebook messaging, it's easy to explain that, look, when you are hostile to someone online, rude to someone online, you can expect certain kind of responses and fruits. But the fruits of the spirit often coincides with what you do to de-escalate any kind of horror you have with someone in over a chat message. So that is, I think, one possible example of how you could use parables as a tool for evangelization. I think it requires imagination on the part of the one who evangelizes, but I think that often it is a Often, but I think often it is one of the ways forward when you struggle to explain something that may not, may not make sense to someone who is not a Christian. Okay, so let me close off this sermon by quickly explaining Ezekiel's 20's parable. Because all parables are meant to be explained ultimately, right? All right, so the elders of the Jews in exile, they make inquiry of the prophet Ezekiel, who has acquired quite a reputation as a prophet by this point of time. We don't know what it is. Background context tells us it's the fate of Jerusalem. God replies by systematically recounting the progress of the Old Covenant and the repeat and the many times that Israel has broken the Old Covenant. And therefore, he says that the forests of the south will burn. 
and this is a cryptic map. This sounds like a cryptic message, but actually, it isn't cryptic. Because if you think, because we, what we know historically is that during this period of time, Judah was not the arid land that we know today. If you go to the Holy Land and where Judah once was, you know it's a fairly arid area. At that point of time, the climate was different. Judah was highly forested. It was located in the south of the promised land. It was known as the Southern Kingdom. So when God says that the forest of the south will burn, he's saying that judgment will come to Judah. And this judgment is as fierce and unrelenting and unsparing as a firestorm, forest fire consuming the entire forest. Of course, the elders, all of them, since we don't want to hear about judgment and unpleasant news and want to hear about hope, this is not what they want to hear. And so their response is to dismiss poor Ezekiel's message as, it's just parables. Is he not telling parables? Is he not just calling parables? And that's an exasperating end to Ezekiel's ministry before the final exile of the Jews. Unfortunately. And I guess often we can sympathize with Ezekiel because often we run in exasperation when we try to convey what we know of God to others. But still, Ezekiel persists. Of course, because if you read Ezekiel 21, goes on to talk about God giving Ezekiel a vision about Nebuchadnezzar standing at a crossroads. One road leads to the capital of the Ammonites, the other leads to the capital of Judeans. And Nebuchadnezzar will sacrifice animals to his gods, and the oracle and animal entrails will tell him to go to Jerusalem. So, I think that, and I think in an ironic way, Ezekiel is a testimony to the continued perseverance and persistence needed for a word. And I hope and I invite the audience to read more about Ezekiel's oracles, not as oracles just predicting the future, but really a messenger who is trying his best to reach a very, very stubborn and unreceptive audience. And I hope that Ezekiel acts not just as a book of prophecy as it's often consigned to, but as a book of encouragement. A book that encourages us to persevere on in the name of Christ. Amen.